God has done this past week, I'll draw your attention this morning to another passage of scripture. If you have your Bibles, could you take it quickly? Again, I'll be shorter than your next Netflix movie. Um, Philippians chapter number three. Philippians chapter number three. I'm honored today in a very special way to have with us visiting from St. Thomas, a dear brother, pastor, man of God, and he surprised us this week. And next time he comes to St. Croix, you got a plan so you can come and preach here, brother. But church, can you help me welcome Pastor Jeff from St. Thomas? He's here. It's a pleasure to have you with us this morning. Philippians chapter number three. I'd like for us to read from verse number four. Philippians chapter three from verse number four. We're reading out of the ESV. If you have it, you can find it there. Philippians chapter three from verse number four. Let's go. Sorry, Philippians chapter 3, yes. Here we go, let's read together. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew, of Hebrews as to the law a Pharisee as to zeal a persecutor of the church as to righteousness under the law blameless but whatever gain I had I counted as loss for the sake of Christ indeed I count everything as a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord for his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and counted them as a rubbish in order that I may gain Christ indeed I count everything as loss sorry I read already verse 9 and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law but that which comes through faith in Christ the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. The Apostle Paul is writing here and he said these words, that I may know him I want to talk to you a little bit I just about knowing God so father this morning take your word dear God speak to our hearts spirit of the living God we rely on your power dear God not on my abilities I have none in and of myself oh God we rely on your Holy Spirit, O oh God, to do what only you can do in this service today. Thank you for bringing and drawing your people into your house. Now, God, feed us through your word. Magnify yourself. In Jesus' name, amen. That I may know him. Many of you are here this morning and you're from different backgrounds you're from different countries you are from different states many of you are from different islands but the one thing we have in common today hopefully is that there is a desire within our hearts to know God the people of God are made up of people who genuinely pursue a relationship with God I want to ask you a question this morning, and this may be controversial, but go ahead, we can do it. Who is the greatest of all times when it comes to the sport of football? Anybody knows? Not American football. Okay, let me, uh, 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 let me clarify this. You call it soccer, but as far as I know, it's played with your foot. So the rest of the world calls it football, amen? So football, right? Now, the, the, the debate is between two. It's between Ronaldo and Messi. All right? Now, 
all the Messi fans, let me see you wave your hand. Messi is the greatest of all time. I see hands in the back, one or two. Oh, okay. Okay, all the Ronaldo fans. Ronaldo is the greatest. Wow. All of you who don't watch football, raise your hands. Yes, yes, many of you. All right, okay, let's, let's go now. Okay, my favorite sport, basketball. Drum roll. Who is the greatest of all times? Now, now, listen to me. Your answer will determine if you continue to be a member of this church or not, all right? I'm just saying that as the pastor here. Anyways, Michael Jordan. All, all of say Michael Jordan, raise your hand. Michael Jordan, greatest of all times. I see about 30% of the church. I love this church. It's my type of church. How about the king, King James, LeBron James? <laughs> All right, that means we need to do some more prayer and fasting in this church. <laughs> but how many of you have been watching the display of nations over the past couple of days at the Olympic uh, opening ceremony? Wow, it was beautiful, right? They are all gathered together for one purpose, to achieve the highest possible athletic goal. They are all there because they want to win the prize, a gold medal. And during the course of these couple of weeks, we're going to hail some people, the greatest of all in the sports arena. We're going to say, he's the best, she's the best, they're the best. And whether you think LeBron is the best or MJ is the best, it doesn't matter, right? The reality is simply this. Each of us here can build a case for either of them. We can say, oh, well, MJ has the most rings between the two. We can say MJ has the most kill, and he has the killer instinct, and all that good stuff. But we could also say, well, LeBron has the most points ever. And LeBron is still playing, and he's still doing it at an excellent level. And you and I will begin to build a case for these people who we never actually knew. Have you ever met LeBron James personally? Maybe you have, through the screens. Have you ever met uh, Michael Jordan? Are you and Michael Jordan friends? Do you have his number? When last did he call you? Do, you? do you talk with him often? But people will build a case for either of them and we'll talk about their accomplishment and we'll act as if we know them. But we really don't know them. You know, it's sometimes similar with God. Many people who claim to be Christians, many of us say we know God. We talk about the fact that we spend time, you know, in church every Sunday. I wore my best shirt to church last Sunday. Or I'm a member of this church, of that church. Or yes, I, I lead a, on the worship team. I play an instrument. Or I sing. Or I dance. Or I do this and I serve in the children's church. Or I give of my best to the poor. I do all these good things. But do you know God? Do you have a personal relationship with God? In other words, we say that we know people, but really our knowledge of them is basically an intellectual knowledge. We can speak about LeBron, we can speak about MJ. We know, him, know them intellectually, but when it comes to experientially, we don't know them. I'm convinced that much of the so-called church today does not know God in an experiential way. And this morning, the Apostle Paul addresses that. He talks about the things in this world that he have held to be of much regard. In verse 7, he said, But whatever I gain, I, whatever gain I had, I counted as what? What do you mean, Paul? Everything you've gained, you count as a loss? I mean, how many of us will say, well, to my house that I own, I count that as nothing? How many of us will say to my degrees, I count them as nothing? Or to my financial status, or my wealth, or my accomplishments in this life, I count them as nothing? Not many of us. We talk about our accomplishments. We sit down, we publicize our works and what we have done, and we say, look, I've gotten here because I have worked hard for this. I've studied for years. I've been to colleges. I've racked up student debt. Amen? 
I've done all these things so that I can say, I have arrived. And Paul says, whatever I have gained in this life is nothing. Indeed, verse 8, he said, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things. And look at this now, and count them as what? That's rubbish. Paul had a different outlook on life. You see, Paul's primary focus as a Christian, watch it now, was to pursue his relationship with God. Friends, the wealth of this world will not satisfy you. The pride of this life will never fulfill you. The things that you feel like you must have to be successful, you will get it to only find out it was not enough. Paul said, I had it all. I've accomplished it all. But what I've found in the midst of it is that all these things are just rubbish. Compared, what well, just now, to Christ. He said, in the midst of this, I want to gain Christ. Now, who was the Apostle Paul? He was a, a Pharisee. He wasn't some idiot who, you know, didn't know anything about the law. He wasn't someone who wasn't educated. This guy was educated to the highest possible level. He had all the doctorates to show. He had all the degrees to show. He could speak several different languages. He was very educated. He was very religious. He said, I'm a Pharisee. In fact, he said, when it comes to the law, I was blameless. So he kept the scripture to the T. He was the type of person that will, after a sermon, say, Pastor, you messed up here. Here's what you should have said and why you should have said it. He knew the word. He was a student of the word. He knew it so intellectually that he could quote the scriptures. He can talk about the messages that were preached. And he can talk about doctrine after doctrine, teaching after teaching, practice after practice. He knew church theology. He knew systematic theology. He knew the, the timeline of scripture. He knew everything intellectually. But he did not have a relationship with God. And I'm convinced today that the way we speak about God in the church setting, a lot of churches, sometimes even us, is as if we don't know him. Because we reference him as the God of this world. And friends, he is the God of this world all by himself. But I want to know even more so, is he your God? Are you his child? Because folks will say to you that everybody's a child of God. Everybody's not a child of God. Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. The children of God follow God. Are you following God with your life? Am I following God with my life? Paul was extremely religious. He was extremely educated. He knew of all the practices. He was blameless when it came to the law, yet something was missing in his life. Are you missing something in your life today? Have you tried all that this world had to offer? Maybe you've tried the money, the wealth. Maybe you've tried the women and the men and all the relationships you can have and you can say, I am the man or I am the woman or whatever the case may be, but something is still missing. You see, friends, there's a, a God-sized void in our hearts. That cannot be filled by anyone or anything but God. And today, Paul teaches us this through his word. He was sincere what he did, with what he did. He was devoted in what he did. He was sincere, friends, but he was sincerely wrong. I remember growing up, right? I grew up in Trinidad. For a portion of my life, and I will see the Hindu people, the culture of the Hindus, they will wake up every morning. And one of the first things they would do is that they would go outside and they will pick flowers. And they had this little temple that they set up. 
and they will go into the temple and they will pray and carry flowers to their gods. Their gods to them was everything. The idols were set up there and uh, let me tell you about these gods. They were some of the most strange looking things ever. Some of them look like the monkey. Some of them look like, you know, fine. But they would go in there every day, religiously, every morning before sunrise, and pray to a God that cannot hear. They were sincere with what they did. They are genuine in what they do, but they are so sincere that they are being misled. And this is the way of the world. We think that because we, have, we are true to what we believe in, or if I believe what I believe and I do what I do, I'm okay. But God says there's only one way to him. And that's through his son, Jesus Christ. And God in his word was reminding them that you need not to focus on just religious activities, but focus on your relationship with God. You see, Religion says, here's a list of things that you need to do. Relationship says, the access to God is through his son, Jesus Christ. And we spend much of our time trying to impress those around us with our religious devotion. But God is saying, I don't need your religious devotion. What I really need is a real, genuine commitment to following God. Paul said, whatever I gain to myself, I count but loss. And I tell you, some of these people, they're really misled. They're sincerely misled. Maybe you are here today and you are misled and you're genuine about it. God understands. But it's not the first time in life we've been misled. I remember growing up too in Trinidad. I had this friend and my daughter cracks up every time I tell her about him. Every night she wants a story about him. But I remember growing up and my friend said to me one day, Hey, the neighbor has mangoes on his tree. And I have asked him for permission to pick mangoes. So can you come help me pick some mango from the neighbor tree? So I was like, okay, sure. We walked over to his yard. Um, for whatever reason, I didn't even realize that we jumped the fence to get into his yard. But he was like, he's not home, but he said we can go anytime. I say, you sure? Yes, you can go anytime. We jump the fence, no big deal. It was a short fence. Go in the yard, climb the mango tree, and we're up there and we're enjoying these mangoes. How many of you know the best mango is the mango you pick fresh from off the tree? Some of you have never picked a mango off a tree. I feel sorry for you. You have no way to identify with this, but it's okay. I'll be praying for you that before the, your lifetime is out, you can pick a mango from a tree and sit down and enjoy it, and you don't have to buy it from the supermarket. Amen? Amen. All right, just kidding. <laughs> but anyways, we're up on this mango tree, and we're eating our lives out and enjoying it, and all of a sudden, it started to rain stones. I was like, wait, that's hail? The neighbor came home, and the neighbor began to realize that there's some boys on his tree stealing his mangoes. And the neighbor began to throw stones. Listen, I never came down a tree as quickly as possible. He began to stone us. I said, neighbor, stop, stop, stop. The guy said, he gave you permission. He said, he's a liar, and you're a liar too. Wait till I catch you. Boy, we jumped that fence so fast and we ran home so quickly. It was like, thank God. But I followed him because I believed that he was sincere. And I believed that he was telling me the truth. But what I was was just misled. Sometimes we follow people in this world thinking that they will lead us to God. Lead us. Some people follow men, young women, women of God. Stop following men and stop following God. If you stop following God, God will bring the right type of man in your life who will lead you into the path of righteousness. Our problem is that we want to follow the man before we want to follow God. And when you follow him and you realize he's not following God, you ask yourself, who in the world is this? This must be the devil. But Jesus says in his word, follow me. And I will make you 
I will make you. I will transform you. I will bring you into a place where you can be all that I've created you to be. And I want to encourage you this morning. Maybe you've pursued things and opportunities and open doors because people's like, take the open door when you get it. Friends, not every open door is from God. Some open doors are there because the devil opened it up before your eyes to lead you down the wrong path. How many of you have walked through a door that you thought was of God but ended up being from the enemy? I have. Be conscious enough, be wise enough to know that God leads his people into green pastures. He leads those who are willing to follow him. Paul says, before I was misled, he was so badly misled, friends, that the Bible says that he was going down the wrong path. And many of us today, we are on the wrong path. The Bible says, broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many there be that travel on it. Narrow is the path that leads to life. And few there be that find it. Our problem today is that we are too focused on the path where everyone is traveling on. We want to be in the crowd. We want to be all about what's happening. Even churches today, like to be honest, we can be so consumed with what every other church is doing that we build our church based on what people are doing. Friends, Jesus said, I will build my church. And the way God builds his church is through the preaching and the teaching of God's word. Everything else is secondary when compared to the word of God. God's word brings life. And I want to remind you this morning that the broad road seems like it's the right road. The broad road is the compelling road. It's the road that your friends are on, your family are on. Many people are traveling. It's the road that entices us. But the narrow road, the Bible says, it leads to life. But it's so It's so straight that when you look at it, you wonder, man, can I actually make it? Paul says, I was on a broad road. In fact, he was devoted to what he was doing. And the Bible says that one day he decided that he was going to go. He was so devoted to being religious that he was going to go into Damascus. On the road to Damascus, he said, I'm going to go and find every Christian possible. And bring them back to Jerusalem bound in chains. I am going to Damascus to allow the gospel of Christ to cease. He didn't want people to talk about God no more. Because based on what he believed, the law was the way to God. He knew that you should keep the Sabbath. You should keep the commandments. He felt like, who are these Grace preachers and grace teachers. Why are they talking about the love of Christ and the goodness of God? Paul was sincerely offended. I'll tell you about the gospel of Christ. It offends the religious among us. The gospel of Christ is foolishness to those who don't believe. But to those of us who do believe, it is our hope, our life, and our everything. And Paul in his zeal, he was so zealous about what he was doing. Paul in his drive was like, I'm going to go to Damascus and I'm going to kill all the Christians if they don't conform. And yes, he got there. But he was on his way there. And the Bible says in Acts chapter 9 that while he was on this journey in verse number 3, as he journeyed, he came near Damascus and suddenly there shined round about him light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am who? I'm Jesus. Verse 5, whom thou persecutest, it is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Verse number 6, and the Bible says, he said to him, rise up and enter into the city and you'll be told what you should do. The important thing here is this. Paul on the broad road had an encounter with God. For some of you this morning, your encounter is today. Where God is saying to you, I understand that you've 
been going after what you thought was right or seemed to be right. But can you consider for a moment that the way that I have really designed for you is through my son, Jesus Christ. Many of us have believed in other gods, other people, other things. And just like Paul, we are zealous about it. We are encouraged to do what we feel like is necessary. But God brought Paul to a place where he confronted him. The beauty about God is this. He confronts us where we are. And for anyone who's just willing in their heart to say to, to God, Lord, I understand that I'm on a wrong path. God, I understand that I'm strained from you. God, I understand that I've gone after my own desire. Just like the Apostle Paul, then when God knocked him off of that horse and humbled him, he said to God, what do I need to do? One of the greatest questions you could ask with your life, my friends, is this. God, what will you have me to do? God, do you need me to change? And yes, the answer is that the change that God is seeking for is not an external change, but a change from within, a change of direction. That's what repentance is. Paul, on the way to Damascus, heading to persecute Christians, had a change, an encounter with God that turned him in the opposite direction now to follow God. How do we know when Christ steps into our life? We are transformed. The Bible says every man in Christ is a new creature. All things are passed away. And what happens? All things have become new. It's an important change that happens like this. You see, the work is not by us, but it's through Christ. Christ in us transforms us. The power of God coming into a dead body, a dead soul, resurrects us and gives us new life. When Paul realized that, hey, I was on the wrong path and I need to get back on track, the apostle Paul said, it's time for me to follow God. Imagine having this encounter where you were going in one direction and then your life was transformed now and you're going in the opposite direction and then now the things that you used to do, you do them no longer. The people you used to hang out with, you hang out with them no longer. The places you used to go, you go there no longer. And now you're preaching a different message. That's what happened to Paul. And that's why now he, he gets to Philippians and he says, whatever things I gain... I count them as loss. Why? Verse 7. Because what will it profit a man if he gains this world? Loses his own soul. Paul says to us, if he could, don't gain this world and lose the one thing that is most important, your soul. Many people today will find out when they get to eternity that what they thought was right was simply the wrong path. Jesus says, I am the way. Jesus says, I am truth. And Jesus says, I am life. Whatever I gain, verse 7, I count as loss. Verse 8 says, indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things. I count them as rubbish. Friends, I wonder, since you met Christ, how many of you can honestly say, I know Jesus is my Lord and Savior? Let me see you slip your hand. You're not ashamed. You're proud of this. Thank you. Over 90% of you. Can I ask you one more question? Does Jesus know you as his child? You see, we... We base our, our relationship with God based on what we say or what we said or what we do. God bases his relationship with us based on the fact that we have received the gift of his son as our Lord and Savior. To understand what that means, it simply means that God says, I, I want you to know me, but the way to know me is to understand what I have suffered for you. God being 100% holy and 100% righteous, 
understanding that men are sinners in our heart of hearts we are all sinners it's not righteous none that do it good and sin it not God in all his glory and his, his beauty understood that I'm a holy God and I had to punish sin so what God did was that he laid his wrath upon his son Jesus Christ he punished him for us he became our substitution he became our sacrifice he became our savior by standing on that cross and bearing our sins and the Bible says as a result of this now if we place our faith in Christ's finished work on the cross, we too can have salvation. Salvation comes about when I gaze upon the beauty of Jesus. The song says, on a hill far away stood an old rugged cross. The emblem of suffering and shame. It was on the cross that Christ Purchase my redemption. It's on the cross he purchased your redemption. It's on the cross he forgave our sins. On the cross, Jesus met God's holy standard. And on the cross, we were able to be set free. And when we understand that our salvation has nothing to do with our good works, it has nothing to do with our abilities, nothing to do with our love for people, our love for the church but our salvation has everything to do with what Christ did on the cross in that he took upon himself my sin and your sin when we understand that he paid for our sins and we look towards Jesus saying Jesus I am a sinner you are my propitiation you are my forgiveness you are my hope it's only then and true then when the Bible says if we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart, we shall be saved. The gospel is simple. We have complicated it. We have made it into, you know, the lights, the camera, the action, everything else the church does, um, the social gatherings and how all this big stuff and everything else. But God says my, my way is true. My way is simple. My path remains narrow. My path remains straight. All I'm looking for is someone who really understands that I so love this world, that I gave my only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but will have everlasting life. And that's what Paul was preaching. He said, all I want you to know is know God. Know what he did on the cross. Know why he did it. When he died, he died for us. When he bled, he bled for us so that we can know him in whom to know is life eternal. This is the gospel. The gospel for which the church exists to declare to the world. The world needs the message of hope. And the message of hope is not in our social gatherings. The message of hope is not in our activities. The message of hope resides in the debt the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is what we preach. And everything else Paul says is foolishness. He said in verse 10, that is why my sole purpose. No, let me say this, right? That doesn't mean that all you do with your life is come to church and follow God and nothing else. That should be our primary focus, yes, right? To follow God. But God has given you skills. He's given you abilities. He's given you gifts. He has sent some of you into a work field. Some of you are plumbers. Some of you are uh, doctors. Some of you are teachers. Some of you, you work all areas of this world. And God is saying, take my gospel and share it with a world that needs to know me. How? through you we are his vessels we are his workmanship we were created to shine the glory on God you know why people aren't coming to Christ today as they need to because our light bulbs are blown we're not shining the light of Christ as we should into a world that is in darkness the Bible says that men love darkness rather than light because why 
Their deeds are evil. But we are the light of the world. A city on top of the hill cannot be hidden. And what God is saying, I've sent you with the most powerful message to ever touch this world, to impart the glory of God into this world, to show people the love of Christ. But how many of us live our life for this purpose? Paul says, that's my purpose in life, that I may know him. And watch this now, the power of his resurrection. Y'all know we're in the book of Acts, and we've been talking about Acts chapter 1. You will receive power when? When the Holy Spirit is what? Come upon you. And you'll be witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, and throughout the uttermost parts of the, the world. Why is there power given to the people of God to be witnesses we are called to be ambassadors of this message of hope and Paul says I want to know him and also the power of his resurrection why because the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead people of God is alive within us when I look at you I don't see dead dry bones when I look at you, I see the power and the potential of Christ at work in your heart. You got to see that too. You got to believe that too. It's not just to be emotionally stirred into believing it, but to be moved in your spirit, in your inner man. When you realize that I am not the same, I'm not who I used to be in Christ now, I am alive. That I may know him in the power of his resurrection. And I may share what? That's the part we want to flip the page over. Amen? Nobody want to share in the sufferings of Christ. But God says all that live godly will suffer persecution. The gospel is not a message of butterflies. Come to Christ and he'll bless you. He'll open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing you cannot receive. You just name it and you just claim it and believe God. It's going to happen. It's not going to happen like that. My Bible that I read tells me that Paul was persecuted. Peter was persecuted. John. All the others. Anyone who says they're going to follow God, expect persecution to come your way. But the Bible says even in the midst of persecution, here's the good news, you are more than conquerors. You are overcomers. So God lays out the picture of it all, the picture of salvation, the picture of following him, and he says, now take up your cross and follow me. Paul says, if you're going to know him, it's a call to follow him. And in following him, this call reminds us that it's a call to suffer. How many of us are willing to suffer for the cause of Christ? You see, to follow God means I have to deny myself and take up my cross and follow him. Becoming like him, watch this now, in his death. And if necessary, if it means that I have to die for what I believe in, I will die for Christ. That's what Paul was saying. Are you willing to die for Christ? Are you willing to give your all for Christ? Giving your all is not standing up here and saying, I surrender all. Giving your all is not doing a trip saying, God, I'll serve you for this week. Giving your all is not being a Sunday school teacher or none of that good stuff, performing in church. Giving your all has nothing to do with that. What it has to do is with an unwavered devotion daily to take up your cross and follow God in a world that does not care for him. That I may know him in the power of his resurrection. I may share in his suffering, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Our Paul was saying here as we wrap this up, What's this? I can't wait to life after death. He knows. He said, listen, I understand that in this life, I'm called to suffer. 
In this life, I'm called to take up my cross. In this life, I'm going to go through tribulations. I'm going to go through trials. But I don't care because what I'm more focused on is knowing God and knowing that his power rests upon my life, knowing that I'm in the will of God, knowing that I'm devoted to the plan of God, to the purpose of God. But guess what? Even if I die in this life following that, I know one of these days I will be resurrected by the same power that raised Christ from the dead. So get this now. We're not living for this life. The Bible says we're strangers and we're pilgrims and we're passing through. Build your house as big as you want in this life. You're going to leave it all behind. Rack up how much money you want to in this world. You're going to leave it all behind. Have all the children you want in this life. Unfortunately, you can't carry them with you. Hopefully, you should tell them about God and they come to know God for themselves. But when we die, we die alone most times. But whatsoever things are gained to us in this life, we thank God for it. In everything, we give God thanks. But we're not going to make material things the focus of our life. You can be financially broke, poor, but spiritually rich. I'll take spiritually rich any day than to be financially successful and spiritually poor. You don't believe me? The Bible says, blessed are they that are poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I don't, I don't, I don't know about you, but the, the focus here is to rearrange our thought process, rearrange our heart from where we used to be and our mindset from thinking about the things of this world and ask God, God, what do I need to give up in this life to know you more? What is keeping me away from knowing you, God? For some of us, here's what's blocking us from knowing God. A man, a woman, a boyfriend, a girlfriend, Hopefully it's not somebody else's wife or somebody else's husband, but sometimes it's that. But what is causing you to not be where you need to be with God? What is causing you to feel that emptiness inside, to feel like I'm not in the right place? Could it be because we've put people in front of God? We've put material possessions in front of God. Paul says, I don't care what it is in this life. I give it up because I want when I am resurrected to life when I stand before God that he will say well done my good and faithful servant verse 12 says not that I have already obtained this oh I'm already perfect but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. In a couple weeks, all the Olympic athletes will will have fulfilled their journey. Many of them will be able to walk up to that podium and say, crown me the winner of it all. Gold medals will be given out silver medals, bronze medals, and people will look at them and cheer on. I watched last night as I saw the boat parade. I know I'm late, yeah, but I only saw it last night. And I saw the nations of the world just gather in this beauty. You know, I saw the fireworks. I saw the celebration. I was like, whoa, epic. And then my heart began to long for a city whose builder and maker is God. And my heart began to long for that day when the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords will stand on his throne and will be gathered nations of this world to the ultimate prize-giving ceremony. When that day comes and we stand before God, I don't care if I never win an Olympic medal in this world. 
I don't care if I ever make a million dollars. I don't care for the things that I feel like I need to have in this world. You know what I care most for, friends? I hope you do too. It's to hear my Savior say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of this world. I want to encourage you this morning. Don't miss an opportunity to know God because you've allowed people, possessions of this world, or anything else to be your primary focus. Make Jesus your focus. Every head bow, every eye closed. Thank you for listening. I want this morning if with an honest heart we can say, Pastor, you know, I heard, I heard the word, you know, and there's some things in my life right now that are hindering me from pursuing, pursuing God in the way I need to. Maybe it's a relationship that I'm battling with this morning that I know it's not right because the Bible says I shouldn't be unequally yoked with an unbeliever, but I, I have feelings for him and I have feelings for her and I love them. I want to follow you, God, but I'm, I'm in the midst of a battle. But today you want to say, God, I'll follow you all the way. I'll lay down my, my life as a sacrifice. Maybe you're here as a, an adult and you know that you've been battling in your heart with some things that are heavy. For some of you, it's anger, it's unforgiveness. For some of you, it's God knows. I don't know. God knows. But will you say to God in this moment that God, I, I, I let go there, God. Nobody or nothing deserves the preeminence in my life but you. If you'd like to say, God, today I devote myself to following you, to knowing you above everything else in this life. Give me the strength and courage to do so. I want to pray for you. Would you simply just slip your hand in the air Maybe that's you this morning. I want to follow God. I, I don't want anybody to thank you. I see you. Anybody else? I, I just want to follow God. I want to know him. Thank you. I see your hand. All over the building, I see your hands. Pray for me. I want to know God. I want to follow him. I want to know him. I, I don't want to allow people to block me from following God. Anybody else? I just want to pray with you real quick. God, without the fluff, without the noise, without the usual, oh God, we bow our hearts before you this morning. In this sacred moment, Father, saying, we want to know you, God. And we want to give up anything, or anyone that is hindering us from knowing you. God, we want to know what it feels like to see your power at work in our lives. I pray for those that raise their hands this morning saying, pray for them, God, that they will follow you, that they will not allow the people of this world and the plans of this world and the things of this world to lead them away from you. God, encourage our hearts this morning to deny ourselves and follow you. God, forgive us for putting people before you, O oh God. We lay down our idols, God, and we choose you. Then today, if you're here this morning and you've never asked Jesus Christ into your heart as Lord and Savior, you heard a lot about him, but you don't know him. And you want to say, pray for me that I may walk after God. Pray for me that I may become a child of God. Pray for me that I will surrender my life to God. Can I pray with you? Just simply slip your hand in the air. I'm going to pray with you that you will make this decision before God today to follow him. Anybody, I want to follow God with my life. I want to follow God with my life. Thank you. Thank you for raising your hand. Anybody else? I want to follow God with my life. I want, to, I want to live for God. I want to serve Him. I want to be a child of God. Then right where you are, can I ask you to do something big and bold and brave? Can I ask you to open your heart and say, Jesus, thou son of the living God, come into my heart. If you want to come, you can come. But whoever you are, say, Jesus, thou son of the living God, I am a sinner. I need you. I need you to be Lord of my life. I need you to be Lord of my life. I need you to be Lord of my life. I need to know you. If that's you this morning, say to him, Jesus, come into my heart. 
forgive my sins. I believe that your son paid the price for my sins. And today my desire is to follow.